Okay, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second day of the symposium on combinatorics and probability. We are very glad to have uh, R.L. Karandikar as the first speaker of the day. And he will talk about introduction to Markov to MCMC techniques. Yes. Over to you. Okay. So, uh, so, in the abstract, I had already mentioned that there are several examples where statistics and probability ideas have an important role in proving a result in maths or in something else which has no relevance to probability. I mean, the problem statement may not have anything to do with probability. Of course, those of you who attended several talks yesterday, few talks yesterday, at least in two talks, there were examples of the same that you saw. Uh, there were graph theory examples. Uh, maybe I missed some others, but there were two talks with graph theory examples. And they are dating to 1940s. Uh, may, maybe soon after Kolmogorov's uh, introduction of probability theory in this formal way. Uh, sometimes uh, the alternate proofs may be simpler. Uh, offhand, I can't recall a result where the first proof came through probability and then only a normal proof came, not probabilistic proof came, but there are several where I, probabilistic ideas will make it simpler. Weistra's theorem on approximation of continuous functions is one such. Now, this part I knew always, and uh, one of the books which we studied as students, I'm sure it's still popular, Simon's uh, analysis book. On, uh, that is where one of the places where I'd seen this Weistra's theorem, and it uh, gives a proof which there is no reference to probability there, but there's something called Bernstein polynomial. And uh, one can see that the proof is essentially binomial theorem and mean and variance thereof, and Trivishit. But I did not have an idea as to where did uh, Bernstein think of this way of writing the polynomials. And it was only recently that I saw that while Weistras proved this result uh, in 19, 1888, uh, in 1912, Bernstein had given an alternate proof. And uh, the connection with probability theory is ob obviously obvious because even the title says so. I have listed below that you, if you can see uh, the original French title and its English translation of the title, demonstration of a theorem of Weistra's based on calculus of probability. So this is 1912-13. Uh, and probability theory at that point was still evolving. In fact, uh, the, this is 20 years before Kolmogorov's book, which set up the framework uh, which made probability acceptable in the math world. But Bernstein preceded that, and this was interesting. So, uh, Today, I'm not going to talk about that. That is something which you all know, including Bernstein's proof, probably. But today, I'm going to look at another example, unrelated to the ones seen yesterday, but still, in a certain sense, connection with graph theory. Not directly, but as you can see, there is a graph easily you can make out. So let's consider one such example as uh, you take a n cross n chessboard. Of course, you will say n 8 by 8 chessboard. That's it. Well, you just think of, as a mathematician, we can always imagine. So you think about uh, n cross n board, where n is some integer. Now, we don't do this black and white coloring as on a chessboard, but we do something else. So each square is going to be assigned a number 1 or 0. Uh, you can think of 1 as black, 0 as white. 1 means the square is occupied, 0 means the square is unoccupied. So each such assignment can be called a, or is called a configuration. So a configuration is nothing but a map from your chessboard uh, to 0, 1. That's the two digit number 0. Okay. Now, a config, such a configuration will be called feasible if all the neighbors of each occupied square are unoccupied. That means every square that is not in the first or second row or first, not first or second row or column, it has eight neighbors. So I have to define what is neighbors. So neighbor is just 
as usual, up, down, left, right, uh, these four, uh, north, south, east, west, as well as northeast, north, uh, southeast, etc., etc. So eight neighbors. Uh, on the first and the last, there will be a dif difference. And in, so, so configuration is feasible if every pair of adjacent squares, at most one of them is one, because any adjacent squares are neighbors, and you cannot have one in both of them, uh, then it will not be feasible. Feasible means uh, in adjacent squares do not have one one. Okay. So, for a feasible square denoted by gamma, let F gamma denote the number of ones in gamma. We may call it weight of that configuration. The quantity of interest that I'm going to be talking about is the average F gamma, average of F gamma, average is taken over uniform distribution on the sum of feasible configurations. We need not even talk about uh, probabilistic language, uh, uniform distribution, we can simply define alpha as one over number of elements, some over F gamma, some taken over all feasible configurations. Okay, So <clears throat> this is the quantity of interest. Now, if I go back in time, I would have considered this completely uninteresting question because what is there to talk about average on a finite set? Average of a function on a finite set? Well, if you think so, just hold on in a minute, you will see what happens. So now let's take n to be 25. Then the total number of configuration is 2 power 625. And Anyone who has thought about how large, how fast the numbers grow or try to do computing, etc., would know that this would be computationally just not feasible to look at all configurations, check whether it is feasible or not, and they, if so, add. So you can't do this computationally. If you try to write a code, doesn't matter how efficient your code is and doesn't matter how many computers you deploy, if all the computers are available today are deployed, even then it won't be done in your lifetime and more. Okay. You can do a back of envelope calculation to so see that. But you may say, well, this is all configurations, but feasible ones are less. Can we scale it down quickly and then scan through feasible configurations? Well. Even when n is 25, the total number of feasible configurations is at least 2 power 169, which is already a huge number. And how do we say that? Well, assign 0 to all squares where, uh, <coughs> let's say, it should have been 1 to 25. Uh, yeah. you, <coughs> your index square from 1 to 25, and even if one of the component, the row or column is even number, you give it 0 you will be still left with 13 rows and 13 columns. And now we have no restriction. You can assign zero or one arbitrarily and they still you will have feasible configuration. So our feasible configurations are at least 2 power 169. And of course, uh, you, can, you can give it a little thought and you say that this is a very poor lower bound. You can increase the number of configurations quite a bit. In fact, remove the top row, top bottom, and you can again do the same. Uh, then uh, alternate once you give zeros and then so on. So you can keep adding and see that number of configurations is going to be quite a bit. Okay, so computationally listing all feasible configurations is going to be impossible. Impossible in a time frame that we are thinking about, our life scan and, uh, lifespan and uh, all computing facilities available even then, Habena. Okay. All right. So, okay. So before I go to some method of how to compute or how to estimate the weighted average, uh, uh, the, the another quantity of interest is. Uh, average of F gamma, but now the weights are not equal or not uniform distribution, but proportional to 
e power minus k f gamma for some constant k. So the quantity is beta is one over some number of elements in S, summation over if all S, S is feasible, of course, solution, feasible configurations. C times E power minus K F gamma F gamma, where C is a constant so that this becomes a uh, weighted average. So summation over uh, C times the summation, number of elements and with the weighted ones is one, okay? Now, you might wonder, why would we even think about this alpha and gamma? Well, hold on, these were, uh, these are kind of toy versions of problems uh, uh, in, of interest to physicists. And uh, the method of solving that I will be describing is actually obtained, derived, or is caricature of whatever was proposed in this uh, paper. Uh, and this maybe is the beginning of MCMC. What is MCMC also? You, those of you who don't know, we'll see what it is, but uh, so it is important. Uh, I have actually now forgotten from which book or which place I have taken up this, uh, uh, this example of chessboard, but it was trying to explain uh, the uh, MCMC technique. And uh, I was like it so much, but now I have forgotten which book I have taken this from. So, yesterday's talks, you, you did see Marco change, but there could be some who did not attend yesterday and are attending today. So, I've just listed down. So, any sequence of random variables Xn uh, is a Markov chain if knowing all the history, if you want to look at what are the chances that given all this, where will you be next? So, Xn plus 1 is k given the history. You... All you need to know is where you are presently. So n is present, n plus one is future, and zero to n minus one is past. So give, this can be also written as given the present, the past and future are unrelated probabilistically. Uh, this is essentially the first example, which uh, other than IID random variables, which are popular in probability and statistics, Markov chain was the first interesting example going beyond that. And uh, this is also uh, dates back a lot more than 100 years. Okay. So the uh, transition probabilities, PIJ, these are called transition probabilities. And if you list them as a matrix, it is called a transition probability matrix. And why is it useful to consider it as a matrix? Because if you look at what is sometimes called the n step transition probability, if you are at zero, at time zero, you are at i. In n steps, what is the chance that you will get to i? Well, that can be computed just as you take nth power of p and that's it. That's the transition probability matrix. Okay. Now, if you assume that xn is irreducible and aperiodic, which means that for every i and j, there is a n so that P n i j is positive. That means from anywhere you can go anywhere in some n number of steps. You need not go very fast, but you can eventually get there. So random box uh, that was discussed yesterday satisfy this very easy to see. Uh, and the second condition is a periodic that uh, G C D of the set of n such that you can starting from i you can come back to i in n steps. That is one. So we do not want a uh, uh, random walk where you just go left and right with probability half half because then you know that you are going to alternate between even integers and odd integers if you are talking of uh, just random box on integers one dimension only then you do, you want to avoid that uh, split of the all the uh, thing in the state space into two parts where you are alternating so the condition two is kind of avoiding that and it is called a periodic so, a very interesting and important result with Markov chains is that if this is so, if one and two hold, then the n-step transition functions converge to pi j. It doesn't depend on i. Limit p and i j converges, and the limit is independent of i. It just depends only on j. And j would be the uh, identified as the unique eigenvector of the eigenvalue one. Uh, <laughs> so uh, these are uh, classical ones. Uh, 
most of you may have known, but okay. now, now the, this result that EN IJ converges to pi j is a classical result on uh, Markov chains and has several interesting proofs. I have myself given talks on interesting proofs thereof, two at least that I know very well and uh, uh, very interesting ones. Uh, but <clears throat> one involves group theory, uh, other involves uh, <clears throat> coupling, uh, another interesting idea and probability, but that's all for today's talk. But also, this, has, this result can be proven nothing to do with probability, just from matrix theory, and it is called the peron frobenius theorem on positive matrices. So, uh, now, returning to our problem of uh, this quantity, how does one identify alpha? Okay. Identify alpha, uh, what we need to do is to come up with a Markov chain whose uh, pi, that is limit of Pnij, is actually just uniform. If you do that, that will help us in computing, in obtaining an estimate for pi. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, oh, I didn't know that I'd written this in the proof here. I mean, one of the way of proving for pi uh, from graph theory is a classical result, uh, is a result on from graph theory. And uh, it's also called Markov chain tree theorem. I didn't know of this phrase till I was giving the talk at IISC and it was pointed out to me that the same thing is also Markov chain tree theorem. And no wonder I didn't know of this because the paper was written after I had finished my PhD. And then I was working on continuum and I was I moved away from finite business. So anyway. Okay, so so the simplest case is for a Markov chain to obtain pi is the case where summation pi i j is one. Even <clears throat> Summation over j is always one, but summation over i is also one. And this is called doubly stochastic. When that means if you take the transpose, that still remains a stochastic matrix. So those sums remain one. So uh, the law of large numbers gives us that for an irreducible or periodic Markov chain, uh, if you uh, generate the, if you look at Markov chain for large number of time, uh, n is large, and you look at f of x t from 1 to n, then this limit is f j pi j. So this is a version of ergodic theorem and also can be think, uh, is also talked about or written as time average equals space average. So the left hand side is the time average for a large time and the right hand side is the space average. Space average of course, with the weighted average. Okay. So, returning to our original problem of chessboard, if we can get, now there is a big gift, if we can get a stochastic matrix, a stochastic transition probability matrix P given uh, by the, the doubly stochastic, therefore, pi lambda equal to one over the number will be the uniform one, and therefore, we will get that uh, <coughs> this right hand side is of interest. We can simulate xj xt for large time and then the for large n, and that left hand side will give you an estimate. Okay. So how do we? So the original problem: there is no Markov chain, there is no transition probability function. So now somehow we have to cook up a transition probability function on our set of feasible matrices feasible configurations so that it is double stochastic. If so, and now I'm assuming that everybody knows what simulation is, then we can simulate this Markov chain and go on. Thus, all we need to do is to get a such a transition probability function. Now, how can we, and I'm now instead of Pij, when I'm talking about this example, I'm uh, going to list that as P gamma lambda. Okay. So then, you'll know that uh, we are talking about this graph theory example. Okay. 
So let us note that while we do not know the cardinality of the set of feasible configurations, given a feasible configuration uh, lambda, we can list all feasible configurations gamma that are adjacent to gamma. This is an extremely important observation because otherwise we think that we don't even know the sets, uh, the set state, the set of states. How many configurations are there? Even that we don't know. Even the cardinality we don't know. How are we going to construct a matrix on that with the required property? Well, here is the key that you give us, you give any allo allocation of zero ones satisfying our given condition, namely adjacent ones are not ones. Okay. Now we can list all feasible configurations that are adjacent to it because we can first list all adjacent configurations. Just uh, move one at a time. So, uh, Sorry, so what is the precise definition of adjacent configurations? Okay. If a, two, uh, a feasible configuration is any configuration such that two adjacent uh, sets states there are not ones. Right. Okay. So you, you have a configuration. So that means you have this zero one uh, on your uh, test board, zero and one on each one. Uh, you can keep changing one at a time. And that way you would have created uh, uh, two power n square many uh, possible adjacent configurations. Then figure out which of the adjacent so constructed ones are feasible, which are not. That will give you a lot of feasible configurations which are adjacent. So, so when you say change one at a time, do you just mean change the state of one cell or yeah, change? Yeah, change, yeah. So, so, yeah. So I, I should have said that two configurations we say adjacent if uh, uh, they differ at exactly one square in, on that. All others are the same. I should have said that. yes. Thank you. Having distance one, basically. Yeah, having distance one. Oh. Having distance one. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I should have said that. Uh, yeah. So. So therefore, the set of adjacent uh, configurations is exactly 2 power n square. And from there, we can figure out how many of them are feasible. And therefore, we have a list of all feasible configurations, right? OK. So we can use this to create this uh, transition probability matrix. So we'll, we'll choose a transition probability matrix so that we kind of uniformly move to one of the adjacent ones. And that's it. So we are going to describe P gamma lambda as follows. Given a feasible configuration, uh, gamma, choose a square S out of the n square squares with equal probability. If any of the neighbors of S are occupied, namely has one, then the resulting, the, the, the one you have chosen now is not feasible, so don't do anything. You, in next step, you just stay where you are. And if all the neighbors of S are unoccupied, that is have zero in, in uh, gamma, then flip the state with uh, of the square. So you have a feasible configuration, which is just assignment of zeros and ones. You pick one of the squares with equal probability and just see if all adjacent ones are zeros or one. If all of them are zeros, then you change the uh, your S is the chosen one. So you change. If S was 1, you make it 0. If it was 0, you make it 1. And if any of the adjacent ones is 1, that means you, you cannot move. That means where you are chosen, that has to be 0. And that 0 cannot be flipped to 1. Because that will violate feasibility. Okay. So once again, out of in a feasible configuration, out of the n square uh, squares, you look at you pick one at random and see if you have flexibility to flip. If you have flexibility to flip, flip. If not, don't flip. And thereby, what you get is your next step in your Markov chain. Okay. And so I've not written down uh, the uh, mathematically the P gamma lambda, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because it's easier to describe. Uh, and While we can write an expression and so on, but we're computing it is anyway going to be unnecessary because 
we can quickly write a code to implement what I have described above. Right? So your feasible configurations is just a, a, a array of size and square, two-dimensional array of size and square. You pick one randomly, check all the neighbors, and uh, move or not move according to this. So it's something which is very while we still don't know how large our uh, set of feasible uh, configurations is, we have managed to create a transition function. <coughs> also, it's easy to see that P gamma lambda is P lambda gamma. Because when you have, if you have not moved, you once again try to move, you will not move. So if uh, so, if the probability matrix has not changed, obviously you are same place. So this is trivially holds. So the only thing we'll need to prove would be when gamma and lambda are different. That means the s that you chose on gamma with probability one by whatever n square, that was a that was a one or zero. But all its neighbors were zero, and therefore you have flexibility of moving from one to zero or zero to one. Neighbors you have not changed. So you can again move back with the same probability 1 by n square from 1 to 0 or from 0 to 1 in that particular square. So a little bit of thinking and you can quickly see that the P gamma lambda described here is doubly stochastic. Oh, I, I should have, uh, I did not write, but I'm just going to just talk it out. Here, we can see that it is irreducible. Uh, because from zero, you can move to any state. So let's say you have a configuration which has some k many ones and all others as zero. From the end, and you start at entirely zero matrix, uh, entirely zero in your uh, n square. Uh, locations array and uh, then you can keep flipping one at a time each one with probability one by six uh, 625 so you can quickly see that from zero you can move to any con uh, feasible configuration and because double is stochastic from any configuration you can move to zero and therefore from anywhere to anywhere you can move in finitely many steps okay and uh, quickly you can convince yourself that the uh, it, it's <clears throat> It satisfies the required conditions. It's a periodicity that is, because anywhere you can stay the same place with prob positive probability. If, if even one of them is a one, then with that much one by that many probability, one by six twenty five probability, you can stay put. And if all are zero, you can move from z all zeros to just one of them being one. You can stay put in that one for one more round, and then you can come back. So. You, you'll have to move to two of them which are closed, etc. So you can figure out that this is a periodic. Uh, or maybe I made a mistake. I tried to simplify something. Uh, instead of flipping with probability one, I was earlier at my write up, it was flipping by 0 0.99 and stay put by 0 0.1, even if you can flip. So if uh, what I have described is not a periodic, we can very easily tweak it to be a periodic. Uh, Isn't it that if it's irreducible, then the, huh? the period is, if it's irreducible, then the periods are all the same or something? Periods are all the same, yes, but... Uh, and if there is therefore a self-loop, then at least one of them can be, you know, it, it can come back to itself in two steps or three, one step or two steps. Or no, if you can come back in two steps, that is that will not give a period. It right? can come back in one, self-loop means it can come back in one step and in two steps and therefore the period is... Oh, oh yeah. yeah, I think it, should, yeah. Yeah, it is a periodic. I, yeah, okay, it is a periodic. One can quickly see that. I for a minute I could not locate, think of my own thought, but yeah. Yeah, it is a periodic. Yeah, yeah it is a periodic. Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, so our law of large numbers applied to the Markov chain, uh, we will get this. So all we need to do is to simulate a Markov chain. We don't know what is the state space, but as I have described already. Uh, P gamma lambda, it is easier to write a code than even to write down a formula for P gamma lambda. And then you can simulate and do this approximation. 
and uh, but if for large large numbers huh? is periodicity a problem because you are dividing by it is not a problem it is not a problem it's a problem if you are using the limit yeah no wait a minute yeah limit of fxn is, yes it is yes, a problem yes that, that is a problem yeah. it is not a problem yes. so and uh, well, with Markov chains, there is always, a, or any limiting theorem, when you are using it to use an approximation, there is always an issue that all you have shown is the limit n is so, but how large should n be? So if you are going to use it anywhere, then you should have a better, some idea of how large n be. And till now, we have started by saying, you give me any doubly stochastic uh, matrix P on our state space, and this result is true. Then is this n the same for all stochastic matrices? Is it different? And so on and so forth. And the, uh, this has been uh, an area of a lot of interest. Even in last two decades, uh, all along, uh, there has been issues about uh, discussions about this. And uh, one solution for this, uh, one way of estimating or getting some idea of how large the n should be, so irreducible or periodic means that one is eigenvalue with uh, uh, no multiplicity, multiplicity one. So what is the second largest eigenvalue? So take all the eigenvalues, remove one, all the eigenvalues which are not equal to one, you take absolute value and take the largest eigenvalue of them amongst these, the gap between that and one, how close is the second largest eigenvalue? That gives you, that, that's something very easy to see, uh, that, that will give you a good estimate of how, if n is beyond, uh, you can get an estimate of the difference using the second largest, gap between the second largest eigenvalue. And a more complicated analysis, uh, I can't even write down all the math thereof, I have not read or, I had read but I don't remember. But the interesting thing is that uh, one is, sees that uh, for an irreducible or periodic Markov chain, we can show that, and it's a finite state. So there will exist an integer n such that p power n, all the entries are positive. So uh, for a, uh, n such that p power n is a strictly positive matrix, namely all entries are strictly positive. And what is the smallest n for which p power n is strictly positive? Uh, these ideas are there in Peron Frobenius uh, writings also in the proof, but it is this smallest n such that this happens. That gives, also gives you a way of estimating uh, uh, how effective n should be. So, loosely speaking, if you have a, a tra uh, transition probability matrix for a irreducible or periodic, you look at what is the largest, smallest n such that p power n is strictly positive? If the n, if the if you sample for something which is let's say ten thousand times that number, that should suffice. That will give you a very good estimate. And in this example, uh, while our s can be huge, we can quickly see that the number of steps needed from anywhere to anywhere I have already described earlier. That uh, will tell you uh, that. Uh, p power 2 power n square, p power 2 power n will be good enough, something like that. Okay. So, and so that tells us that this is a good probability. Okay. So, <clears throat> so this is a good example to use uh, Markov chain techniques to simulate uh, prob uh, probability distribution to, to simulate a Markov chain and from there to estimate alpha. Well, now this idea of simulating from a distribution and using it to estimate is perhaps uh, goes back even earlier, but it was extensively used in this Manhattan project. 
And I suppose some of you may not even know what was Manhattan Project. Manhattan Project was a secret name. Manhattan was a secret name for the uh, making the first atomic bomb, which was eventually dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So the technical team which was working on this project, they didn't know exactly what all was happening, but it was some of them knew. And it was called the Manhattan Project. And this was used, this idea of simulation was used in the Manhattan Project. And uh, this was all secret. So ideas in Manhattan Project were used by others to write some other related uh, uh, tech, uh, articles. And one such was an article by Ulam and Metropolis in 1949. And in that, they introduced the word Monte, Monte Carlo technique. And Sorry, quick question, if you can go back one more slide. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, you said so M here is 2N, right? Twice N. Yeah, so actually, I, again, a typo, I think 2N square it should be. Ah, okay, okay. Because I was wondering on the next slide, you said that... Uh, no, no, 2N square, I think. Uh -huh. so on the following slide, I think you said that M is a very large M or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but, because it's quadratic, okay. But, yeah. But, so, even for a, uh, but even for a small n like 25 uh, chess board, uh, 2n square is uh, still small. That may is compared to 2 power. Obviously. Yeah. Right, right. If you go to the next slide, uh, that's the reason why I was wondering is because of your first line. The end of it is for a very large n. Yeah. But, 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 but you just mean 2 In this case, you mean 2n square. But in general, in general MCMC, you mean very large n. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this the smallest thing such that this happens gives you an estimate on how many, but it doesn't say that for if you simulate for two n terms, you will be fine. Oh, okay, you are. Okay. I see. That. Among other factors, part. Right. This, this factor can be used to estimate how far you could be, as right. long as you do a good multiple of this ten thousand times this, you are fine. Ah. That's what I mean. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Rajivda, so huh? was uh, Los Alamos the first place where, say, of physicists course. and engineers used? Uh, MC. That's where Manhattan Project was based. Yeah, yeah. This is the first place. My question is the first place where physicists and engineers used MCMC or whatever, Monte Carlo methods? Yeah, they did not use MCMC. They just used Monte Carlo methods. Monte Carlo methods. Okay. And this, as far as we can make out, this is the first one where, which is recorded and known. Okay. okay. The idea of using simulation was perhaps earlier. Okay. I see. Perhaps uh, in the conflict between uh, Fisher and Carl uh, Pearson, uh, which method is better, uh, uh, testing which one is better and so on. They had already argued with each other using what we may now call Monte Carlo techniques. Okay, okay. But these okay. are all probability statistics related examples. Right, right, right. And this is a physics <laughs> engineering example. Physics and engineering example, yeah. Thank you. And then, the, of course, but it had mathematicians. Ulam is there. Of course. But, only, okay. Not only physicists and engineers. No, no, no. By the way, one should read the book called Brighter Than a Thousand Suns. Okay. If you haven't read it, it's a fantastic thriller based on Manhattan Project. Okay. No, I have not. I'll, I'll write it. Yeah. I'll write down the name in the chat. Yeah, go ahead. I'll write down the name in the chat. Okay. Anyway, but uh, I mean, yeah, so this may be the first place it was used or one of the first, but doesn't the idea of sort of drawing from a distribution and then using many averages to get to the two mean or the two you know, somehow like empirical kind of thing date by Yeah, but you need a computer for that, right? You cannot do just n equal to 10. No, no. I understand, but theoretically, the theoretical... Theoretically, part, theoretically it is there in Einstein also, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Theory Einstein, is there in Einstein's writing also, I suppose. Right? I would have thought it comes, goes back to Gauss and De Moivre or something for central... Oh, maybe. Even yeah. things like that, I would have thought. Even yeah, the, probably, probably. By the way, Gauss's birthday was yesterday. I see. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So now back to the uh, chessboard problem. Uh, so we have already noted that it is easy to simulate xt plus one given xt. Uh, all we need to do is to choose a x zero and then start. And you can start x zero to be all zeros, or you can take it as this odd even one. That example that I wrote that would be a starting point. You all you need to write down is one feasible configuration and start love all and generate. And by the way, even going back 20 years, when I first wrote a code to do this, simulate this, uh, I could, uh, uh, on a uh, simple computer available in my office at that time, I could uh, do a billion uh, uh, simulations. Okay, 
t n equal to a billion and uh, <clears throat> but of course my code had to be efficient it had a c++ code that i wrote okay all right and with current hardware you can do it very very fast millions uh, very quickly okay very very quickly but our answer does not depend on x0 but the choice x at hand that you will get based on your efficient code will still depend on x0 go weekly and uh, for a critical problem how do you go about you know how large m should be what x0 you should choose etc etc and there are this has been a lot of interesting issue even in the statistics community so there have been two teams of thought one which believes that you just pick any x0 somehow come up with some x0 which is fine and then put all your money that is time money everything available to you to pick the largest m that you can and hope for the best so there is a large group which just believes in this philosophy and then there is another group which thinks that okay this may be fine but you are maybe worse not worse off to maybe willing to consider 10 distinct x zeros perhaps removed far away from each other in your formula or in your uh, design and uh, just take the same m for all of them and then take an average and that will give you an idea as to whether your m you have chosen is good bad ugly whatever okay and there is intense debate going on and i now forget a journal but one of the journals uh, which, which write letters about statistics and probability probability in statistics one entire issue was on a discussion on this theme whether one sample size in mcmc is enough or uh, oh, by the way this technique that i called is what is called mcmc uh, generating a markov chain with your given thing and using so Mar monte carlo is just simulation and mcmc is when you use it with a markov chain one sample in mcmc or multiple that is not the title of the uh, that the uh, uh, volume of that journal, journal but i belong to the latter that means at least get 10 maybe 100 different x zeros and if if even after that if your x at m are similar to each other then you can believe that your m is close enough but this is a matter of debate okay now let me come to the other so this is giving you alpha but what about beta now we want to estimate this object and we know k but we don't know c to compute c we we'll, we are back to the question of we we'll have to get a s and so on so forth so one obvious thing would be that we first estimate the number of elements in s by some way and then proceed with this technique which is terrible very 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 difficult to do uh but by taking f to be 1 and using our uh, using this itself as f you can estimate what is c and then take a ratio and get to it but in general those who work with numerical methods know that if you want to estimate something which is a ratio of two quantities estimating numerator and denominator separately you may be near the estimate or you may be way off the estimate we never know so it is a bad idea and you should estimate the given number directly and not simulate numerator denominator separate so that means can we come up with a transition probability matrix let me now call it q gamma lambda such that the uh, the true <coughs> by the limiting distribution for this transition probability matrix is proportional to e power minus k s gamma or equal to c times this for some c so this pi star is then the unique eigen vector for q and we may first think this is useless we don't know what s is and now how the hell are we going to construct a thing which is proportional to this object and this is actually very easy to do but okay but if this is the unique uh, thing once you have done this you can simulate and, and it should be such okay that is the important part we need to construct such a matrix q and then it should be such that there exists is we know but then if there exists we don't know how to simulate from that right so <laughs> you should be able to write a code quickly to simulate from such a q then uh, the rest goes through and we are done okay and 
how to do this goes back to the 1953 paper, which is the one which introduced MCMC technique. I don't think they use this phrase, but this is the beginning of the MCMC technique. Uh, it's called, uh, it's a paper, joint paper by Metropolis, who, who wrote the Monte Carlo paper that with Ulam. But along with Metropolis, there are four other names. Uh, uh, and uh, Rosenbluth, there's a couple, and then there are two others. I don't, I couldn't figure out whether they are, that also was a couple or two uh, cousins or brother, sister, I don't know. I could not, I, I did not spend time doing that. But the first one is a couple and there's a lot of controversy about this article. Uh, the technique given there has been named after Metropolis. Maybe he was the senior most amongst them. And that uh, thing is called Metropolis algorithm in MCMC world. But 50 years after this paper was written in 2003, uh, there was a conference to celebrate 50 years of MCMC involving physicists, engineers, and whatnot. I don't know if there were any statisticians there, but physicists and engineers, there is references. And uh, Rosenbluth in that has written an article. And then there is a blanket statement that Metropolis had no contribution to this art paper other than he enabled us to have access to computer. That's what the statement by Rosenblitz says. Though it was denied by one of the two tailors earlier who said that all five of us spend extensively large amount of time every night to work on this problem. Which Rosenblatt? Marshall? Uh, yeah, I think Marshall Rosenblatt, who is a, yeah, I think Marshall, okay. yeah. Okay, nice. <laughs> and in fact, he said that the entire coding was by his wife and most of the ideas were the two of them together, with tailors <laughs> contributing a little, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and the controversies, even in Wikipedia, you can get and then you can get a whole lot of more dig on it. So. <laughs> okay. But the main point is that uh, doesn't matter who started it and though we call it Metropolis algorithm, maybe it was due to Rosenblut, maybe it was due to Teller, doesn't matter. But the idea I'm going to present is a toy version of what is the idea there. And as we can see, it is a physicist's idea. It's not a mathematician, statistician, or probabilist idea. So, let us start with a P gamma lambda that we had already uh, talked about, which is a double stochastic matrix from where we can simulate and it seemed to have a good convergence property. The Markov chain generated with that has a good transition, pro uh, has a good limiting properties. Okay. So we start with such a P and now you modify that Q, P to get a Q as follows. Uh, you define uh, alpha gamma lambda as minimum of one and pi star of gamma divided by pi star of lambda. So if that ratio is one, it is one if uh, otherwise less than one and tweak P by this alpha, multiplied by alpha. P times alpha and you get a Q. Okay. And <clears throat> so some of the P's you have tweaked down. So that means now the resulting thing, the sum is not going to be one, but well, no back, no problem. You adjust it by saying put. You increase the probability of staying put by the required quantity. Okay. So starting from P, we can quickly describe this matrix Q. And then the next question is, you know how to simulate from P. How do you simulate from Q? And I suppose most of you are uh, listening to me today have read it somewhere or the other or seen it. Uh, okay. uh, before that, uh, uh, a simple algebra to verify that the, the uh, resulting Q is, uh, is such that the unique uh, uh, eigenvector for eigenvalue 1 is pi star. Okay, uh, trivial calculation, but if, uh, for adjacent, if they're not adjacent, the probabilities are zero. And for adjacent gamma and lambda, if one is smaller, P gets uh, modified, Q doesn't, uh, uh, P gamma lambda modified, P lambda gamma doesn't get modified. And the modification is such that uh, this equation holds. Pi star gamma, Q gamma lambda is pi star lambda Q. So this is called the detailed balance equation. Uh, popularly uh, used in physics a lot. 
uh, detail. So this gives you a resolve. Uh, 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 <clears throat> Systems where you can uh, take the time. Reversibility. Reversibility. Yeah. Reversible markup. Yeah. So, uh, and reversibility is clearly, uh, then, then that's it. Uh, that will tell you that this is a stochastic, this is a matrix with pi star is the unique eigenvector. Okay. So, this is simple. Uh, now, the, therefore, the question now, so, so our stage is set as long as once we are convinced that. Uh, if we can, given that we can easily simulate from P, if we know how to easily simulate from Q, then all things are set. Because uh, this example tells you that the kind of, if P power N IJ is positive, then P power A, Q power N IJ is also positive. The value may have been tweaked down, but it remains positive. So the, the criteria that you I gave, to this, uh, which will tell us whether something is good or bad, remains the same from P to Q. And how do we simulate samples from Q? The idea goes back to von Neumann, who was also part of the Manhattan Project and probably he developed it for the Manhattan Project. Uh, he wrote about it in an article in 1951 and it is called the rejection sampling method. And the paper is, I've listed here. Uh, and then, uh, there are many interesting things about the rejection sampling method. All statistics students at ISI certainly know. In one of the in one of the courses, it is of course introduced rejection sampling technique. Uh, in words, I'll describe. But uh, what some of you may not have known uh, is that around the same time, in 19 early 1950s, an idea similar to that of von Neumann, in the context of finite samples was introduced by, I should say, Professor D.B. Lahiri at that time at ISI to come up with a probability proportional to size PPS sampling method. In some, uh, this the PPS, you might have learned in the sampling techniques uh, course, uh, sample series <clears throat> course, but uh, the PPS sampling method due to D.B. Lahiri is nothing but the rejection sampling of von Neumann. And uh, it will be described. Oh, I did not describe it here. I, I forgot to write a slide, or maybe I'll discover it. So the rejection sampling method goes on to say that you want to sample from. Sorry, you want you know how to sample from P. So you gen if you are at a state space X T. You simulate a sample from P and you call it the, uh, <clears throat> uh, that, is, that is your target or th that is one proposal. So proposal move to gamma from lambda, you generate by probability P and you accept the proposal with probability alpha gamma lambda and uh, with probability one minus that just stay put. And very quickly you easy to see that this is, uh, This will work. And by the way, my ISI intense interview for MSTAT, I was given a problem like this, which I could not solve there, but then I could write out a proof when they gave me the solution that <coughs> if you are all your one is a fair coin, how will you simulate a probability, success probability one third using a fair coin? And I'm sure most of you know, know the answer, but that answer is rejection probability. You simulate it twice and three of the four outcomes you assign to the three things you want or each with probability one third and then the fourth one you repeat again. I didn't know it then but I was given the solution and asked to write the proof which I did. That was my essay entrance. May I make a guess who asked this question? Yes. Uh, one of the Sinhas. No. Sinhas was, uh, was not there at ISA at that time. Oh, okay. Then I can't guess. And the committee which interviewed me, they were, believe it, believe it or not, there were more than 30 persons sitting in the committee. And the committee was in our old uh, 3.5, which was a classroom later. More than 30 people were sitting in this. Sense. Wow, <laughs> 30 people. <laughs> no, I don't know. I can't guess. I thought one of BK Sina asked it because he used to ask this kind of questions always. This was uh, the dean who was Ashok Maitra. 
Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. And uh, I might have forgotten, but for TK reminding me this several times, and uh, of course TK was there in the committee too. But <laughs> but did they also continue asking? The, suppose the coin is not necessarily fair. What will you do? All these things. They oh did. yeah, yeah, yeah. So in fact, yeah, the so. question was not fair coin. The question was you don't. What if you don't know anything about that coin? Oh, okay. Then it's more challenging. Okay. Yeah. Then you have to toss it more than twice, right? Three times at least, I think. So various such things were there. So right. I just said, choose an N such that P power N something, something, something happens. Right, right. Will such an N exist? Can you prove such an N exists? So okay. it went on that direction, as you said. But yeah. Okay, okay. Okay. So uh, so the whole point again is that we started by saying that our uh, sample, uh, the, the population, the size of the state space, you don't know the S. And therefore, the constant of proportionality, little c that appears, we don't know. And yet, you can implement the Markov chain P as well as you can implement this uh, probability computation because it is a ratio of F. And my F, uh, pi, uh, pi is like this. So uh, the ratio of the pi's. Okay, ratio of the pi's can be computed even though we don't know the c. So you don't know the constant c of proportionality c. We don't know what is the uh, dimension of your uh, state space, and yet we can implement this MCMC technique. Okay? And it is precisely these two things uh, which made this whole technique uh, popular with the Bayesian group because in uh, Computing conditional distributions, this is the, typically the problem that you want to come, you want to take a ratio where you can only describe the proportional to this conditional probabilities, but you need to simulate, you need to normalize it. And you don't know the normalizing constant and you can still simulate. So that is why the uh, Marco chain techniques uh, or Monte Carlo techniques were not part of probability theory teaching. So this paper is 1953. My master's was 73, 70, 76, 78. I was not taught. As a PhD student, I didn't read. As a researcher in probability, I didn't read. I came to know of this through one friend in mid-90s who was working on those, uh, <clears throat> was working on Bayesian stuff. From him, I came to know that there exists something called MCMC and I still was not interested. Till TK talked about it to me and I actually read about it in only as late as 2003. Anyway, so uh, last one now, I should give, be done in two minutes now. So uh, the, what we did was a uh, metropolis algorithm and that required a double stochastic matrix or the same thing will work as long as you have a reversible Markov chain. Okay. Uh, wait. Uh, Oh, that requires it to be double stochastic. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. So that works only with uh, uh, not just double stochastic. We had that as reversible. Pij was Pji. Okay. So uh, not just double stochastic, lot more. And uh, Hastings uh, in 1970 introduced the algorithm. Just we just do a little modification for the uh, uh, rejection sampling method, and there it is. So if you have a good algorithm. Uh, Markov chain with transition probability P, uh, which is easy to simulate, uh, then you want to get a Q's which has uh, H as the stationary distribution. You define Q by this formula. Qij is Pij minimum of one and Hj Pji divided by Hi Pij. Basically, with this, you can say that the uh, <clears throat> Detailed balancing equation works and therefore the whole thing works. Okay, you can essentially that idea. So, uh, Metropolis and Metropolis Hastings algorithms, these are the two common things. And while I've talked about it only in the trial versions of finite state, the same thing for the Bayesian stuff, uh, people use it a lot in continuum and that's fairly easy to move. And, uh, but the interesting thing is that the basics of all this date back to the time when these things were thought about and they were thought about in the context of some problems in hand. So it's exactly one hour since I started and maybe a good time to stop. Yep. Thank you very much for a very nice and very 
interesting anecdotal films, connections we'll talk. Uh, are there any further questions or comments or discussion? So I have a question. Yeah. So basically, simulating technique is something uh, which is very uh, it seems to be very useful in any in the mathematics also. For example, yeah. if we can approximate E using simulating technique, uh -huh. then can we approximate uh, zeta three using this simulating technique? And so that we, we, we want to actually conclude the transcendence of this theta 3 or like that. No, you can estimate it, but how will that prove transcendence? That I'm not sure. Simulation will work, but whether it will give the objective you have in mind, I'm not so sure. I'm not giving it a thought. But Because simulation or whatever, any method will always approximate using a rational number all the time. Yeah. Whether that will prove the transcendence, as Rajiv Dai is saying, is not clear. And the okay, example would be if you discuss that how it is similar to E. Yeah. So the simulating is from uh, here. Is it simulating using primes or something? Of which there are infinitely many. Or I'm just curious how the simulation. I don't know. I have not given it a thought, but all I said is that perhaps it will be possible to do it, but it will not achieve the objective we had in mind. Okay. Transcendence part is fine. But so are MCMC things available for countable state space also then? I mean, like in this kind of frame. In general, I'm sure they're available on RN also. But I'm sure they're available. I mean, I, I've not read about it, but I'm sure they're available. And if there's interest, we can think and figure out one how to do it. Okay. I can tell you one example where in pure so-called pure maths, I don't like this terminology, pure maths, etc. But so-called so pure maths, uh, computer techniques has been used recently. So, for example, if you look at free groups, F5, say F5, free groups with five generators, look at automorphism group of that. That was known to, there was a conjecture that this, is, this has something called property T, whatever that is, some, some rigidity property. This has been proved by a group of people using a semi-definite programming and the optimization techniques. And then some, some cases were checked using a computer programming and simulation. So these are popular techniques now, but yes, these are very popular techniques of proving theorems. This is a classic example because this is the, the conjecture was so-called pure math. And then uh, the method was optimization, which is so-called applied math. And this is why I keep repeating my statement of my professor, Philip Protter. He was in Cornell and Rajiv Da knows him very well, Yeah, I think. So yeah, Philip yeah. said, this is a misnomer. You should either say pure mathematics versus contaminated mathematics, or you should say applied mathematics versus useless mathematics. <laughs> right? I, I, it's a very good joke and I actually agree with that. And I yeah. tell my students all the time this joke. So. Yeah. Yeah, so thanks for pointing this out, uh, Koshik. I think, yes, definitely simulation techniques, computer techniques are very useful these days yeah. in mathematics in general. Mohan wants to say something. Mohan? Uh, yes, Rajiv. Thank you. Um, this uh, contribution of Hastings, he was a statistician and he did not collaborate with any of these uh, engineers, uh, uh, physicists, anybody. Uh, so his work was totally uh, for statistical applications, wasn't it? But it did not get popularity for years, right? Yes. Still. It, well, he himself lost interest and moved away from UBC to Victoria and stopped doing research. So, so well, amongst my friends, you were one of the early ones to do PhD statistics. So, how when did you hear about it? Let me ask you. Uh, well, you there doing, was. You were doing Bayesian stuff too. So yeah. So uh, Gelfand, Alan Gelfand, and uh, uh, Smith they popularized this, uh, and there was a conference. And Berger took all of us to that uh, conference, and that was the first time. Where were you? When you're still a PhD student? Yes. Oh, okay. Final year of a PhD. Or okay. okay. All right. So now I can say, I mean, okay, good. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. A very nice lecture. By the way, uh, the kind of examples that you started with, there is this, uh, I think Mohan would know it much better. There's the, this class of metropolis algorithms now called Hamiltonian. Metropolis. Uh -huh. So won't they be very useful for these? Because this is basically they're using the Hamiltonian structure, etc. So. 
look, Patnil, I, I know nothing about those. I only look at these things in the statistical application. So no, no, but statisticians are using Hamiltonian uh, MCMC these days. Well, in a particular context, yes, but uh, uh, mostly in um, uh, uh, machine intelligence. Yes, in that more, context, more, mostly in those days. Yeah, yeah, those. Yeah, because the Hamiltonian is a physicist concept again. By the way, uh, there's still three, four minutes. So let me tell you another story and it involves uh, TK, T. Krishnan, whom several of you know. And uh, my starting with MCMC. Okay. So I, as I said, I, I read about it a little, but very little. And uh, uh, if, in one of our meetings when TK had already retired and was working with Crane Software, TK talked to me saying that, will you help us develop a, a simulation uh, module for MCMC as part of Systack? I said, how soon you need it? If you need it in two weeks, the answer is no, because I don't know what you are talking about. He says, no, four months. So I said, okay, let me read about it. And then TK asked me a question. He, we were talking about what is MCMC. And then he told me, he said, that something is all very messy there uh, because the summer, supposedly the simulation is a, uh, will give you some answers every time. He didn't say how large N is, etc. But he gave me an example where it fails miserably. So he said, you look at a, like our standard clock, digit, not digital, our analog clock, except from one to 12, you take it numbers to one to N, N is very large, okay? And now you take a, a random walk uh, on it and maybe make it uh, irreducible, a periodic by making one third, one third, one third. You stay put one third, left and right, one third, one third each. So it is a Markov chain with all the nice properties, yes. So this whole thing should work there, yes. And yet, you know that if you you cannot do it even in n steps, you will be uh, far away. When n is very large, how do you hope to do it in much smaller number of steps? You can write down estimates and so on and so forth that it will not work at all because in k steps, you will be at most uh, plus k minus k and typically uh, plus square root k minus square root k only from anywhere. So this is an example where it will fail. So how what do we do? How do we do it? And that is what led me to look at literature about, you know, how to get hold of this n for which p power n will approximate pi carefully and so on and so forth. So, and uh, I did it in few months and then in four months, I did write a simulation module for Systat for uh, MCMC. So I, I thought uh, I should remember TK, it came to my mind, so I should mention it to others who several of you know him, I suppose. and. Uh, Older generation ISS students, certainly. Some CMI students also. But, okay. Did, did he teach at CMI also? Of course. Oh, okay. Uh, several, uh, at least three, if not three or four years, he taught okay. students. Okay. Okay. And towards the end, when he was very ill and was unable to move much, he still wanted to visit CMI. And one day, we had arranged it so that he came in his car. He could not come down from the car. Uh -huh. But the car was there at the portico and several of us went there to meet him. Oh, of course. So he, he was very much with uh, CMI towards the end. And uh, in fact, BV used to ensure that he's taken back home properly and various such things. Are there. Yeah. We even had a small uh, celebration after uh, his death. We even had his birthday celebration and then after his death, another celebration or another memory, memorial session, etc. Okay, let's stop. I think it is another minute. So, uh, okay, so yeah, yeah. Can you. I just take a minute to come back? I'll just yeah. have some yeah. water and come back. Yeah. Okay. Let us thank the speaker again. Yes. Then we can go.